All right, I'm done with the introductions. Let me pray the most powerful prayer I can pray in Jesus' name. You ready? Lord, would you help in Jesus' name? And everybody says, amen. 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 Acts chapter 7. If you guys have your Bibles, we're going to be uh, reading one verse today, and it's going to be verse 51. When I say reading one verse, we're going to stop and read this verse and discuss many verses, but I just want to to land on this Acts chapter 7, verses 51 thought. If you're new to our church or you have not yet been with this series, I want to give you just maybe a 60-second encapsulation of what open heaven means. Open heaven is this concept that Stephen challenged the religious leaders of that day to begin to talk to them about the fact that God does not live in a tent anymore and he does not live in a tabernacle anymore, but he lives in this place that we call open heaven. As I've spoken to you over the last two years, we are currently, I believe, in the Church of America, we are in an anti-anti-reformation movement. Uh, many of you guys know the story or the church history of people like Martin Luther, who basically uh, went to the church or the, the organization that was the church and says, no, we want the Bible in a language that we can understand so that we can take responsibility of our own walk with the Lord because we believe that the responsibility of our walk is not to be given through priests or pastors, but it's our job and our responsibility to steward the walk with the Lord for ourselves. And that started this church history of saying, okay, we want to take our relationship with the Lord into our own hands with the help and assistance of men and women of God that will equip us to do it. But now we're living in this phase in state where we're having an anti-anti-reformation movement, where there is a church uh, that is really so, so exhausted that they're basically giving their stewardship of their, their life back to the church. And I want you to know that's a very dangerous place to be. Where you begin to say, like, the, the pastor is just going to tell me what to do. Or the church is just going to tell me what to do. What you're basically doing is handing the deed of your spiritual walk to someone who's not qualified to do it. God has no grandchildren. He has no mediators uh, except for Jesus. And so you have to know that there's a personal calling and an open invitation for you not just to be servants of Jesus, but to be friends of Jesus. John 15, 15 says, no longer am I going to call you servants, but now I'm going to call you friends. Because if you were a servant, I would keep things from you. But no, now you're a friend. I'm going to open up heaven to you to talk to you about things so that we can have a personal relationship with him. And so we've been talking about this concept of this idea for the last month. And I want to just, just pause here because I think open heaven can, can come off as a very spiritual, spiritualistic, hyper-Pentecostal, hyper-gift-seeking um, kind of thing. And I want you to know that it is more granular than that. I was, I was reminded this week of talking to a friend in the church, and I begin to share the story of my oldest son, Jaden. Jaden, when he was young, as many of you know, got diagnosed with a rare disease called Opsoclonus Minoclonus, and his eyes were dancing in his head. They literally said to him, put him in a wheelchair, size him for a helmet, he's gonna be an invalid for the rest of his life. And the prognosis was this stark. He's gonna have seizures that are gonna to lead to retardation, and you're, the son that you once knew is now no longer going to be. And my wife and I were thrown into this, this intense season where we went to the Lord and said, Lord, would you heal? Now, my, my doctrine um, falls short when it comes to healing because I, I personally do not know why God heals some and does not others. Even though I know in his word, he promises healing for all. It's the wrestle, it's the tension between what, what is and what should be. So I want you to just land with me here in, the, in this moment because I think healing sort of encapsulates the pressure cooker that is. But my son got radically healed. He was in the arms of his grandmother who was praying in tongues and whether you believe this or not, I don't really care because now my son's healed. <laughs> Just being honest. She's praying in the spirit over him. And in a moment, something jolted him and brought him up. And he sat up and she tied some shoes on him. And he began to walk like nothing had ever happened again. That's the, that's the miracle working power of God. So we went to Dr. Gene Hayward in, in, in Oakland at the Kaiser Permanente there. And we followed up appointments for 12 months because my son is the only uh, known patient that has ever been diagnosed with this disease to actually recover. The only one in America. It's a bona fide miracle. But she said something to us 
as, as she cleared him from her care, she said, you know, you might want to be careful because um, he's, he's going to have some learning disabilities. And we didn't really think anything of it because we were like, my kid's fine. And I watched my son, who's 19 years old now, begin to progress in this life. And there were some challenges early on in school. Let me pause here and give you the end of the story. Uh, not only did he uh, prove the doctors wrong or prove uh, the, the infirmity wrong and God healed him, they said that he was never going to play baseball, never was going to play sports. He actually made the state all-star team for Oregon. I just love how God does that. What the enemy means for, for harm, God turns around for good. Uh, started getting straight A's in high school, started taking AP classes. I'll never forget the moment he came to us and said, I feel like I'm supposed to take AP classes. And I said, okay. Because <laughs> I had realized his struggles during school. Not only that, he just passed through the, the Josephine County. I'm bragging on you, son, and hopefully you don't get embarrassed, all right? He just passed as one of the youngest, if not the youngest person to ever pass um, the building code inspector's <laughs> test this last this last month, just watching God's miraculous hand on his life. And I know God's got great things for him, not in the future, but today. He's a walking miracle. But there was this moment when uh, Jaden was five or six years old, and I had just taken him, from, uh, taken him to a Sacramento Kings basketball game. And he was sitting in the back seat, and his feet weren't even being able to touch the bottom, and they were dangling. And I preached to him one of the greatest sermons that I've ever preached in my entire life to him. I began to talk to him about how unique his testimony is going to be and how there's no one like him and God's created him special and unique with a purpose and a plan that, that no one else in this world is able, gonna, able to fulfill. And I began to talk to him about this dream, you know, this dream of like, God's got you, son. You're a miracle. And I remember preaching to him as I thought I was doing proper by him and only as I began to talk to him about how special and unique he was, this panic came over him. And like anxiety began to fill him because oftentimes we can get so hyper spiritual that we create uniqueness as some unattainable place that I'll never be able to fill only to live a life of disappointment in the faith. Come on, somebody. So this five and six year old began to teach me some things about life. And he, he looked at me with, with tears in his eyes and he says, dad, I don't want to be unique. I just want to be normal. I just want to be able to read like all the other kids. I want to be able to, to play sports like all the other kids. And so it was in that moment that my, my idea or, or atmosphere of success over my son began to get very practical. And so in the wall in his room, uh, it's taped on a wall with his handwriting. It'll say, if you want to be great, here's what greatness is. Here's what success is in the kingdom. One is you're going to love God all your days. How many know it's a miracle in this day and age to actually be raised in church and to love Jesus all the way through? That's what, that's what we have. That's, that's the hope for our children. That's the hope for the next generation is that they don't view the chaos that is inside the church and it turns them off from the power of God. But to love God all their days, to love them in the highs and to love them in the lows, but never to have the ins and the outs. And so I begin to pray that, you know, Jaden, success for you in your life is to love Jesus all your days. Second is, is to find out what you were called to do. And whether, whatever you're called to do, to do it with all your, your might and your ability. If God wants you to be a trash man, if God wants you to own your own company, if God wants you to, to work at McDonald's, if God wants you to, to, to be a doctor or a lawyer or a pastor, whatever it is that God has you doing in that moment to do it with all that you can and all your might. That there's, there's, there's no lofty expectations that your value or your worth comes from what you do. Your value and your worth comes from who you are. Yeah. Going somewhere with this. Third is, is the hope is, is that, son, you're going to be able to call one woman your wife your whole life. Yeah. That's success. Success is, is that um, you'll be able to support and honor and lead and love one person. Because there's only thing wrong, there's only thing, one thing worse than not being married it's being married to the wrong person. And singlehood is actually a blessing that the Bible talks about in, in, in the Bible. That we shouldn't look as those people that are single as, as less than or inferior to, no. But, but if you're going to get married, make sure you hold out for the person that God's called you to marry. So being married, and then the final thing is, is that your kids are going to be the only one that's going to call you dad. What a goal would that be? 
And so we can get very hyper-spiritual in church, and I just wanted to pause at the beginning of this message because open heaven is this cadence and call not for the church to find the fringe or to seek after the minor things, but to seek after the major things. That, that, that the church would know that there is an open invitation to have a relationship with the Lord with a leading in the power of the Holy Spirit over your life to a place of victory. And so where we're going to get to at the end of this message is, is a question I'm going to ask you right now. If the doctrine of your life, of your, of your religion, doctrine is your set of beliefs, if your set of beliefs of your life is leading you and keeping you in a place of bondage, it's probably a good idea to look at the doctrine of your, of your life or your ministry. So many people say, I believe what I believe, I know what I know, I sense what I sense, and I'm not moving on that. But listen to me, let me shake you as your pastor. If the doctrine of your life is keeping you in the bondage, your doctrine is wrong. If your doctrine is keeping you um, not healthy or whole in relationships, your doctrine's wrong. If your doctrine is keeping you in a place to where you're having generation, generational curses in your family that are, that are being perpetuated through generations and cycles, your doctrine is wrong. God never commanded us to have to live under bondage of slavery to sin. He's commanded us to live with freedom and liberty to pursue sanctification through him so that we might be able to free other people. Because free people free other people. So let me just pause here really quickly and state this very, very eloquently and simple. If your doctrine or the rules that you live your life by are causing more damage and destruction than they are freedom and liberty, you need to take a, a, a step back and say, is the doctrine by which I live my life, is it proper and is it right? And is it according to this word? This word is our final authority. And so open heaven is an invitation to look throughout scripture to say, I want to build my life upon the foundation that is the word of God. Because when the, if the foundation is the word of God, it's going to lead me to a place of freedom and liberty in Jesus' name. All right, we, we ready to get rolling here today? That was my introduction, and here, 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 here we go. So we have learned over the last, the last several months that, that we have this opportunity, and here's my picture of God. I don't know how else to draw this, but we have this opportunity to live with open heaven with the Lord, smiley face, um, where, where it, we have a friendship and a relationship with him. And we recognize in past lessons that we've been reading scriptures, there is a war that's taking place in the heavens. Ephesians chapter 6 says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers over the darkness of this age. And this, this, this morning, I'm going to describe to you via some scriptures what is actually happening that causes the blockage between God and us to be able to have this relationship in open heaven. So this war. And this war is really fought, this war is really fought on three fronts. It's, it's, it's fought through the spiritual wars that we face. It's, it's fought through the sin wars that we were born into. And it's fought through this spirit of religion that tries to capture and keep us stuck. So Stephen says in Acts chapter 7, verses 51, you ready for this one? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Many people wonder what got Stephen killed. It was verse 51. <laughs> so I'm going to lightly, as your pastor come to you and speak to you out of Acts chapter 7, verses 51, if we can make some ground rules, right? The ground rules are, is I really want to live. <laughs> my beautiful wife, my kids, I, this, is, this is coming from a heart of compassion that says oftentimes the things that keep us bound need to be confronted by the anointing and the presence of God, oftentimes through a preacher, to get you unstuck. Look to your neighbor and say, it's time to get unstuck. So this war, the war of the spirit, is found, it's found, scriptures are found like Ephesians 6 and 12, okay? Ephesians 6 and 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age. In other words, people are not your problems, the problems are the problems. 
It's my job as your pastor to always tell you that you're welcomed, but sometimes the spirit that you carry needs to be rebuked in Jesus' name. Like the spirit of criticism, where the glass is always half empty, that the church is always going to be at the bottom rung and we're never going to overcome. That is a lie from the, pit of the, from the pit of hell. Right? So you are welcome to come to church, but sometimes the spirits that you carry need to be called out and rebuked. Because if you're ever going to live in a place of health and wholeness in Christ, there are some things that you are carrying now that you were never meant to carry. And so we, we wage war in the spirit. We're going to talk about this. And then we wage, we wage war uh, with a sin nature. The Bible says in Romans uh, 320, 3.23, for all have sinned. I'm sorry, 6.23, for, uh, for the wages of sin is death. And then there's the war of religion, Acts chapter 7, uh, verses 51. Acts chapter, we, we just read it. This war of religion is, is the Holy Spirit comes to you, and when the Holy Spirit comes to you, there's this pressure cooker environment that gets created over your life. So this pastor is going to do my best for the next 20 or 25 minutes to help some of you. When the Holy Spirit confronts what, what was to what should be, this pressure cooker environment comes in your life. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit comes and begins to convict you. And he doesn't just convict you of the things that you are doing wrong. He begins to also convict you of the things that you should be picking up and doing. And the spirit of religion begins to thrive in our lives because we get stuck because we really like what we used to be and we really like what we used to do and it makes us comfortable just like the children of Israel in Egypt it makes us very at least there was some structure in our life and, and we love the things that we used to do and used to be because at least we had some kind of identity and that great exchange begins to happen from what I used to be to what God's calling me to be and, and there is this nervous pressurized environment that comes but the Holy Spirit, listen to me, the Holy Spirit has to be given free reign in your life to confront and check you on the areas of your life that he wants to bring you out of bondage and into freedom with. And so we're going to talk about these three, these three areas here uh, that, that really block open heaven. The spiritual war, the sin war, and the religious war. Are you guys with me this, this morning? If you guys need handouts or all these scriptures, we have gone through the, the painstaking process. When I say we, the team here, there's handouts as you walk in with all the scriptures that are going to be read. So there's a war in the spirit. Our weapons need to be rooted in the fruit of the spirit and expressed in the gifts. So the Bible doesn't leave us, God doesn't leave us helpless when it comes to the war that, that happens in the spirit. So we recognize there's principalities and powers and rulers of this age. The demonic presence in our world seeks to create chaos. God, he comes in and he tries to seek and create order. And it's in this process where the demonic tries to come in and bring chaos and confusion, where God says, if you want to live in bondage, chaos and confusion will be adjectives that will describe your life. You'll, you'll live in a roller coaster. Some days you'll be really good and some days you'll be really bad. Your mood will change from really good to really bad. You'll love God and love the church one moment and you'll call them all hypocrites and sinners the next moment because that's who they really are. But it's coming out of a critical spirit that's trying to separate you from actually growing in God. So there is this war that's taking place. There's this critical nature war. And the Bible says that you have to win the war in the spirit if, if you're actually ever going to walk in freedom. And so the goal, the goal is the fruit of the Spirit. And let me talk to some, some, some Pentecostals in this room. We oftentimes get the order mixed up where we think the fruit of the Spirit are subservient, uh, subservient to the gifts of the Spirit. I don't care if you can get words of knowledge if you can speak in other tongues, if you don't have the fruit of the Spirit operating in your life, there's something wrong. What have, I, what have I told you for two years? If you can speak in tongues, yet gossip in English, there's something wrong in your life. You're tracking with me. So these have to be, these have to be in proper order. So let's, let's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, 
joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, fruit, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We, we have this hyper-Pentecostalism that tries to teach us that when the Spirit takes over us, we lose self-control. It's not true. When we are in the Spirit and the Spirit's overflowing us, the fruit of the Spirit should be our adjectives and the gifts of the Spirit should be our weapons. So let me give you the gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. There's the utterance of wisdom. There's the utterance of knowledge. There's the gift of faith. There's the gift of healing. There's the gift of miracles. There's the gift of prophecy. God puts in the body people who are able to discern spirits. The Bible says that there are various kinds of tongues. There are the interpretation of tongues. 1 Peter chapter 4, 10 and 11 describe how these gifts should be in operation. If, if you have 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 through 11, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Verse number 11. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified. In other words, the giftings that God gives us is not to lord or manipulate over somebody, it's to actually serve them and to bring them out of bondage and into freedom. In the church, we get that different. We use the gift of prophecy or words of knowledge as a way of manipulation and control, when really, that's not what that gift is actually used for. It's actually used to serve and to create a foundation by which you can love and serve each other. Everything, everything that God saves, serves. And so when it comes to this spiritual war, we have to know that God has given us weapons. He's given us the fruit of his spirit. He's given us the gifts of the spirit. And he's also given us, in Ephesians chapter 4, he's also given us offices or placeholders, or people to actually come in and help equip the saints. Ephesians chapter 4, 9 through 15 talks about the apest, or, or the five-fold ministry gift that's given to the body of Christ. And he gave what? Say them out loud with me. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. It's, the word shepherds is actually where we get the word pastors from. But I, I want to just, just point out here in this moment, this five-fold ministry gift this five-fold ministry gift, in the American church especially, we only actually fund two of them. We fund the pastors and we fund the teachers. And we wonder why the American church is struggling to make inroads and in actually reaching out to their world because why? The church has basically said, give us the pastors and give us the teachers, but the apostles and the evangelists and the, and the prophetic um, you keep those because they're hard to understand. They're, they're, the prophetic people can be like musicians that can be a little weird. I'm married to a musician, so I can say that. <laughs> the evangelists can be so hyper-focused outside the four walls of the church that they can get very angry at the people that are inside of the church. The apostles, I mean, could you imagine calling someone an apostle today in the, in the American church? Hey, apostle. It just sounds like very haughty and very prideful. But where does that come from? Where, where does the lack of, of Christian biblical understanding, and so what we're doing is we're trying to fight this war that's in the spirit that, 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 is, that, is, that is so like demonically keeping strongholds over the church, and we're doing it with half understanding of how these should actually take place. And so what we, ha what we have to do is, is, is my encouragement to you, one of your homework assignments for this week, is to take this first part of this message and go, I wonder how the American church should stop being the American church and just start being the church. I wonder how it should look like. Where are the prophets? Where are the evangelists? Where are the apostles? I know that we have a pastor, and I know that we have people that, that can teach the word, but why is it that we are casting off the prophet while we're casting off the apostle, while we're, while we're casting off the evangelist, when in order for us to live in this in the spiritual realm, we don't just need the fruit of the Spirit. We don't just need the gifts of the Spirit. We need the offices of the church to be full and, and, and forceful because if we're ever going to win the war 
of revival that needs to break up over Josephine County, we need to be able to answer this question. We gotta answer this question. So I framed it, and I'm gonna give you some answers at the end of the message, all right? So this, this, the, the war of the spirit, okay? The second, the second war that's taking place is, is this sin war. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain, if you've never had anyone explain to you uh, we use this word sin as a big overarching um, encapsulation of all sin all the time. But l- let me break down sin. There's two, there's two big kinds of sin. There's the, the sin of commission and sins of omission. These are the sins I commit, and these are the sins that I commit by not doing. So these are the ones I do. So if I, um, if I rob a bank... If I shoot somebody, if I murder someone, those are sins of commission. Then you have sins of omission. Uh, The Bible says, to him that knows what is right and does it not, to him it is what? Sin. So the Holy Spirit doesn't just come and convict us of unrighteousness. He also convicts us of righteousness. It's a fancy way of saying the Holy Spirit, when he's active in your life, He doesn't just tell you what not to do. He begins, if you'll allow him, to begin to tell you what to do. So he'll say, take that out of your hand and don't do that anymore. Don't lie, cuss, cheat, steal. Don't sleep around. Don't don't sin, sins of commission. Take those out of your hands so that I can not just leave you empty-handed, but I can put giftings and talents and abilities and purpose in your life so that you can actually be equipped to live in freedom so that now you can free others. But again, listen to me, the pressurized moment that the church lives in is is what should be meeting what needs to be, and a lot of people are confused about what I should be doing. And so, first off is you have to have a good proper understanding of the battle of sin. So, how many know that there there are different kinds of examples of sin in Scripture? So there's, um, there's words like transgression. There's words like iniquities. Iniquities. There's words like ab- abominations. Abominations. There's words like trespasses. So we're taught in the American church that all sin is sin, And if you break one, you break them all. And that's true when it comes to the spiritual war that we face. The truth is, is that um, we were born into sin. The fall of man, we were born into sin and we needed a savior. And no matter what sin we commit or don't commit, we were still born in sin. And that's why God had to send his son Jesus so that we can be saved. But in the natural, there are different consequences to sin. So if, if my wife comes to me and says, do I look good in this dress? I gotta be careful here. And I tell her, baby, you're beautiful, no matter what you're wearing. But if she looks really awful in that dress, am I lying? And did I commit a sin? Now, if I take that same sin and I go murder somebody, are there different consequences in the natural? Should there be different consequences in the natural? Should be. And so what we do in the American church is we, we basically lump sin all together in, category, in the category of sin, and we have all kinds of lasciviousness happening in the church, like really bad sin, and we, we're treating everybody as though, hey, there's minor sins and there's major sins, and we're all sinners, and that's true. But someone has got to tell you that sin never stays in the same spot And it's like a snowball that keeps rolling. It's the reason why if our nation does not address the sinful nature that we are living under, the pride months that we're having, the things that are are in the culture of our nation, we are going to end up like Sodom and Gomorrah if we're not already there. And so for us to be in the church saying, like, it's, it's okay, it's, it's, it's wonderful, it's, 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 they have the freedom to do that. No, listen to me. The nation that sins begins to sin more and more and more and more and get more decrepit more and more and more. And just as it goes for the nation, listen to me, it goes for you. The little sins that are in our lives that are unchecked, if we're not careful, 
They'll be like a snowball. We, we've watched this. If, you were, if you've been raised in church, we've watched this. I remember, I remember in the church where we would be concerned about watching rated R movies. Do you guys remember the culture of, of, of holiness versus legalism? We would, be, we would say, like, little, be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little ears what you hear. We, we would talk about atmosphere. We would talk about, there was a day when, when ready for this one, Christians didn't drink alcohol. There was a, there was a day when we wouldn't, we wouldn't go to the casinos. We wouldn't go to the, the, the vineyards. We wouldn't, we wouldn't, it's not because our salvation was in question, but because there was a fear and trembling in the church. We wanted to honor God. And listen, if you have the freedom to do those things, and you feel like you've got those things squared away, as I always tell people in private, do you. Let me do me. Let, 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 let's, let's walk with the Lord together and see what the Lord does. There is no condemnation or judgment if you feel like you can have a, a glass of wine or alcohol. But I want you to listen to me. It's my job as your pastor to talk about the slide that has happened in the American church. There is a, there is a definite slide, and then we're wondering why. Why are we losing our kids? Why are we not living in revival in our generation? It's because we do not have a proper understanding about the consequences, not just in the spiritual realm of sin and compromise, but what happens in the natural realm. And so my, my hope is, is that with this Open Heaven series that you'll go to God and you'll say, God, if I have failed in any way to keep your statutes or your laws or, or the ways that you want me to live by, I'm not going to tell you what I should do. I want you to tell me what I should do. Yeah. Open heaven is not me telling God. Right. It's the opportunity to allow God to tell me and to get the strongholds that are out of my life so that future generations can actually win. So sin, is this, this word sin is, is a, a big word where we, we define as missing the mark. It's a, it's a word used to describe all unrighteousness. The word transgressions. Uh, a good example of someone who transgressed is, is Judas in Acts chapter 1 and verse 25. He knowingly crossed the line, stepping over God's way. How many has ever transgressed? I'll raise my hand. Man, if I had all the money in the world and I could, I wish I, could, I wish I could buy a couple days back in my life. It would save me a lot of heartache. It would save my family a lot of heartache. Transgressions. Listen, you don't want to step over God's way because when you step over God's way with your free will and how just he is, he's got to allow in your life those things that are coming, the consequences to your decisions. Transgressions. And then there's iniquities. A great example of, the word, of, 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 of iniquity or iniquities is Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18. It's premeditated, planned choices, originating in heart, rebelling against God. Let me give you a great example of, of iniquities. Ezekiel 28 and 18 tells this incredible story of Lucifer, who's, who would then become the devil. It's like the origin story of Lucifer. Lucifer is up in heaven, and the Bible says, this is, this is the, the, the judgment on Lucifer, but by the multitude of your iniquities, I want you to stop here and ponder God's grace even in heaven. It wasn't that Lucifer, when he committed one iniquity, he was out. What does the Bible say? He committed iniquities. So God, listen to me, God loves you so much that he's going to give you and allow you to walk in grace, but there comes a point when your choices become decisions. And a lot of people in the, in the church today are, are saying, yes, God forgives me of my choices, my choices. Paul writes, for the thing that I want to do, I don't do. But the thing that I don't do, I, I do. And there's this, there's this thing that's embedded in us, a sin nature that's embedded in us, that to the best of our natural ability, our willpower, we just can't get it right all the time. And we just start walking around, and that's the choices that we make. But there comes this point in our life where our choices become decisions. And then when they become our decisions, the Lord has to allow his hand to walk away from you. The Bible says that, that in Samson's case, in Judges, Samson in the King James Version wist not knew, or he didn't even know the Spirit of God departed from him. Many, many that are in the church today, in America, 
don't even know that they are walking in the disapproval of God because they have so lived their life by a doctrine that is so anti-God that they think that the picture of God is that they can make any choice and those choices can become decisions and they're just going to get up to heaven and pull out the Jesus card. You got to be careful. You got to be careful with sin because sin, it corrupts and it doesn't just corrupt your, your actions, it corrupts your doctrine. It, it corrupts. We don't have fear and trembling in the church anymore. We've got grace and mercy. We've got sloppy agape and, and iniquities. Iniquities. God's grace is seen in, in this scene where, where my picture of God, some of our pictures of God would be the moment that Lucifer, he heard Lucifer start trying to have a, a third of the angels. You know, you know how hard it, it is to, to cast a third of the angels down or get a third of people in heaven out? It wasn't like just one bad conversation. How many, like how many hundreds of conversations did, did Lucifer have? But God, and he heard them all. But God's hope was like, don't, those choices, don't, don't let them become decisions. And he was trying to give Lucifer some grace to be able to change and, and, and repudiate what he was doing. But those iniquities, those iniquities, they stack up and those choices become decisions. And my hope for you as your pastor is that you re recognize that big sins, big iniquities, aren't just one bad decision. There are many small decisions that lead to that, lead to that bad, bad one, big bad one decision. Then the Bible talks about abominations. There's many examples of abominations, and one of them that we really like to preach in the church today, or we maybe we don't, but we homosexuality is an abomination, Leviticus, and we start. We start getting very hyper-focused, listen to me, hyper-focused on someone else's sin when the Bible also says in the book of Proverbs that six things the Lord hates and seven is an abomination, one who causes discord among the brethren. We're very good about pointing out someone else's sin, but yet we'll go continue and gossip in our abomination. It's why, it's, why Stephen, it's why Stephen looked at the religious crowd and he said, listen, you stiff-necked people, God wants to do some incredible things through you. But because you resist the Holy Spirit, there's going to be a judgment time. There's going to be a, a, a coming to Jesus moment. And I, I'm telling you that this morning, and I'm not just speaking to Parkway, the church that, that I have the opportunity to serve and lead. I'm talking to the people that are going to listen to this for months and years from now. Listen to me. You will never get to the place where God wants you to get unless, unless you allow the Holy Spirit atmosphere to confront the things that are in your life, the transgressions, the iniquities, the abominations, the trespasses. Trespasses are a false step. It includes the many choices leading up to the decision to, to cross or step over. God, God, would you forgive me and help me win this sin battle in my life? Like, Lord, I don't... I want to have open heaven, and I recognize that I'm never going to ever, in my own willpower, in my own willpower, am I ever going to win this, this sin battle? But thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. When, you take commun when we take communion next, remember this lesson. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. Because, because Jesus, he's built this wonderful bridge. The work that he did on that cross, the empty tomb, the victory so that I could have victory. God didn't send his son to go through all that he did so that I can remain stuck in my bondage. God sent his son, Jesus, to have victory over his grave so that, so that I don't have to live in mine. What a beautiful picture that is. So we recognize that there is a war of the spirit and we recognize that there is a war of the flesh. And we also recognize that there is the war of religion. The movement of the Holy Spirit will always confront the atmosphere of religion. They cannot exist in the same space. The Holy Spirit will not invade a space that he is not welcome. Thus, religious, thus religion and its spirits are hard to root out. And I believe deliverance through the vehicle of repentance is needed to win this battle. As I said last week, 
We need Stephens who will confront so the Pauls can live. So let me get to the question of this day. If my doctrine creates the atmosphere for bondage, then my doctrine is wrong. And I need the Holy Spirit in my life to create open heaven so that I can yield to the moving of the Holy Spirit in my life so that the freedoms and liberties that I have in Jesus so that I don't just can experience them, but other people around me can experience. Can I get real? Me as your pastor. I love Jesus. I love him with all my heart. I've done the best I know how the last 20 years, 20 plus years in ministry to submit to his leading and walking in obedience, but there are still things in my life where I, I have yet yielded over to him. I know you guys know this, but like if you were to take this shirt off, there would be a huge six pack underneath here. <laughs> if you guys get to come see me at the lake this, this upcoming week, I mean, it's my boys, they, they've seen it. You guys are proud of it. The dad bod. When it, when it comes, when it comes to, to my eating habits and my workout habits, knowing that I know that God wants me to live fit and healthy, I fall short. All of us in this room, I don't, I don't care if you're a pastor on stage, I don't care if you're an usher, I don't care if you're a staff member, there are places that the Lord is going to be, going to be signaling or centering out in your life. Woe to you if you go, well, mine's not as bad as, as that other person's. Because that is the spirit of religion alive and well in the church. What we should come to is we should come to the place where Paul says, and a wretched man that I am, Lord, would you help me? Would you help me be the best version that I can be so that I can lead people in freedom? We, we do this in the church a lot. We, we cast off responsibility to somebody else. And what, what I'm trying to tell you is this church has a mission. And it's going to require, it's going to require us and our members and our attenders and our, the people that call Parkway their home. It's going to require us to get very real before the Lord about the things that are in our lives that are blocking open heaven in our life. For some of us, it's, it's, we've, allowed, we've allowed the demonic strongholds in our life for so long that we've become callous to the moving of the Holy Spirit. You're really good about not committing sins, but man, are you really bad about not picking up the things that you need to pick up? You're really good about being faithful to church on Sunday, but when's the last time you led someone to Jesus? When's the last time you invited someone to, the, to, to come hear your testimony? When's the last time you allowed the Holy Spirit to move on you so much that while you were in a grocery store, you reached out to a stranger with love? All of us. This, this is not your past. Listen, it's not coming out of, fr out of a frustration point. It's coming out of mission critical for the house of God in America to stop playing games because we've been playing games for so long and we have lost so much ground in our communities and in our world. But God is saying, sons and daughters, there is an opportunity right now for, for open heaven over your community and over your lives that the things that have hindered you are going to hinder you no longer if you will learn how to walk in submission and obedience to His will and His way. To win the war of the Spirit, to win the war of sin, and to win the war over religion, it requires the same answer. Lord, here am I. Here am I in my imperfection. Here am I in my weakness. Here am I in my struggle. But God, I know that through the power of declaration, I know that I'm your child and you have given me every tool of victory to win this fight and I submit myself to your will and your way and I begin to declare out of my mouth something different. I'm not going to agree with the enemy any longer. I'm going to agree with the word of God, what it says about me. God, if I'm sick, by your stripes, I'm healed. God, if I'm broke, you are my provider in Jesus' name. You're going to give me ideas for businesses. You're going to give me ideas for structures. 
If I'm unhealthy, Lord, would you help me, give me ideas and, and the willpower and the strength and the conviction of my life to understand that I am modeling in my life or I'm not modeling in my life the fitness that you want me to have, Lord? Lord, this word is going to be a lamp unto my feet. It's going to be a light unto my path. Lord, no longer am I going to allow my stinking thinking to get in the way of victory in my life. Lord, I allow, Lord let this word, let this word just, just sink into my spirit and into my life. God, I don't want to see a community robbed anymore. I don't, I'm tired of seeing the drug addicts just cycle through drug addiction with, with, and, and hearing explanations. But Lord, would you send a demonstration of your power to Grants Pass? God, would you send it? God, failing marriages, would you bring them back together? Lost people, would you send them here, Lord? The ones that no one else wants in this community, send them right here. Send them to Parkway. And when you begin to walk this thing out, man, this is a light. This is a light. To light into my feet. Man, victory begins to, begins to happen. And I cannot wait for victory to break out in the pews at Parkway. When the things that you've been battling, you've resisted them, and now they've got to flee. And I don't know about you, but I want to invite open heaven to be part of my life. I want, I want, it, I want it to not just be something that I say. I don't want it to be a spiritual term that I just sort of operate in, but no. I want it to be part of my life. I want victory in the name of Jesus to be part of my life. And I want, I want open heaven to be declared over Parkway. The things that have hindered us are going to hinder us no longer. The spirit of criticism, you've got to go in Jesus' name. The spirit of religion, you've got to go in Jesus' name. The spirit of I'm okay, be gone in Jesus' name. Darkness that's in our lives, the, the power that, that some of us are dealing with in private of, of all kinds of addictions, you got to be gone in Jesus' name. The spirit of infirmity, you got to be gone in Jesus' name. I, I, have, I have just noted, this is your pastor bloviating at the end of this message. It means talking too long out loud. That's what that word means. This pastor has seen God's hand work for two years when it comes to sickness and infirmity in this, in this building. We just had another miracle today happen in the middle of service. Had the report. Um, Chase, grab this microphone and go, go walk it over to, to Didi. Just right where you're sitting. Tell, tell, tell the church what the Lord did today. Right in the middle, right in the middle of church. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Michael. So some of you might not know, I know you see me standing and worshiping throughout the service, but back in um, 2018, at the age of 39, I was diagnosed with arthritis in my hips. And um, I could barely stand for five minutes during that time. I was out of work for like four months going through physical therapy. Um, I remember there was some good days, but mostly every day was pain, every single day. So it's been six years now. and. Um, People have prayed for me, you know, they said you're healed, but, and I believed it and I felt better, but then I would feel the symptoms again. So I was like, God, that don't sound like healing to me. I'm <laughs> expecting it not to feel this because I don't want to feel this. I don't want anybody to feel this. This is painful. This is very hurtful. You know, cried, you know, many nights and just like, God, I just need healing. You say you're going to use me to heal people. Look at me. I, can, I can't be on the praise team like I used to. I can't, you know, your spirit will move upon me and I run around the church or I dance. I can't do any of that anymore. I can't go out in the streets and witness because I have to sit down. I have to, I can't stand. I can't walk. I was walking around the track and gym, really couldn't do any of that anymore. And, you know, like I said, people was praying for me. And, you know, I just, to be honest, I got to the point where I really didn't believe. You know, I didn't really, I knew God could do it, but part of me was like, I don't know, you know. So I was in prayer this, hallelujah. I was in prayer this morning, hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell y'all, if you don't go to 9 a.m. prayer, you're missing out. There is, I need to pray even more at home, but there is something about when you yes. enter that room, hallelujah. Even if you're not praying, it'll make you pray, hallelujah. <laughs> so I was in there praying and um, I came out, went to the restroom. Excuse me, I went to the restroom. And <laughs> while I was in the restroom, and 
as you all know, I'm a part of the prayer team, so we stand back here to pray for people. So there's been times I've stood back there, but it's been very difficult. I can stand here because there's a pew in front of me to hold on, but it was very difficult. But while I was in the restroom, I heard, and I was thinking about standing back there, I heard, go back there and stand because I've healed you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. Glory to your name. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. You know, God will meet you in the funniest places. Hallelujah. <laughs> but while I was in that stall, I began to laugh and I began to just laugh and thank God with excitement. And Sister Connie was standing here and I came out. I was like, should I tell anybody? <laughs> and I was like, Sister Connie, this is what I heard when I was in the restroom. And I tell you all no lie. Today, I stood there the whole time. I felt no pain. I lost. Yes. Hallelujah. And I'm going to tell you honest truth. I want to be honest. I want to be truthful. And I was thinking about going to let the pastor know. And Sister Connie came to me. She said, you should let pastor know. And I said, you know, Sister Connie, I thought about that. I said, but you know, some, I've been where I felt like I was healed, and then I feel the pain again. And she was like, you got to do it. Yes. Defeat the enemy and what he's trying to do. He bring those false symptoms. Yes. And I said, yes, you're right. I'm going to let Pastor know. And I tell you all, no lie, I feel good. My body feels fine. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. I found myself running to the bathroom, walking faster than I've walked. Hallelujah. So yes. I thank God for his healing power. He is able. Hallelujah. That's yes. my testimony. Yes. yes. It's what we've lost in the church is the power of declaration in the face, in the face of fear or symptoms or things that we're seeing to still agree with what the Word of God is saying. It's like some of you need to practice this over your kids, the kids that are wayward. Um, the Lord spoke to me uh, when I was dealing with, uh, when we were, Brooke and I were going through this, the symptoms with Jaden and, and my wife's illness was, was ravaging. I heard the Holy Spirit say in a prayer moment, do not put a period where I've put a comma. What we do in the church is we declare the period and not the comma. And the power of declaration in this moment as we get ready to uh, end this service, but the power of declaration that's going to come in here is, Lord, open heaven is declaring that the freedom that you've called me to live in is my destiny, it's my mission. And Lord, through it all, the ups and the downs, all glory to you. All glory to you. The times when I feel like I'm winning, all glory to you. The times when I feel like I'm losing, all glory to you. Because it is a power of declaration in our lives. Declaring his word. Stephen, he looked up and he declared the open heaven. And what did he see? Jesus. You get what you declare. And the power of declaration I believe needs to be alive and well in this church. We're not just gonna, Grant, Parkway is not just gonna touch Grant's Pass, Parkway is gonna touch the world. It's gonna be a church to the nations. Little old Grant's Pass is gonna be a church to the nations. It's gonna, we're gonna send missionaries and we're gonna send pastors and we're gonna send apostles and teachers and prophets. We're gonna, we're gonna be able to, to infiltrate churches all, the, all throughout Oregon, all throughout this nation, because why? The mission of open heaven is one of victory and not defeat. We're gonna be the head and not the tail. We're gonna be above and not below. We're gonna, we're gonna not just be conquerors, we're gonna be more than conquerors. We're gonna have the greatest marriage ministry in Jesus' name, right? Where's Keith at? We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna have the greatest prayer ministry. We're gonna, we're gonna be able to teach and preach all over this world, why? Because we are going to agree with the good report of the Lord and we're gonna declare in Jesus' name. Would you guys stand to your feet? My wife is gonna sing a couple songs. And then we're going to dismiss today. Yes. And the Holy Spirit come. Holy Spirit dwell. And fill your church with joy.
practice your prayer this morning. And Holy Spirit, dwell here, Lord. And fill this church with joy overflowing. And peace overflowing. And love but you know that your heart's not right with him. What you feel in this room is this tangible presence wooing and drawing you to a place of relationship, a place of open heaven. I don't know your story. I don't know the pain you've gone through. I don't know what sin has caused and wrecked havoc in your life, but I know that God sent his son Jesus so that you didn't have to live under it anymore. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed all across this room and say, Pastor, I need to know that my heart is right with him before I leave this place. And I want my life to be what you're describing, a place of open heaven, where what has been meets what's going to be. And I allow the Holy Spirit to convict me of not just what I should not be doing, but what I should be doing. You say, Pastor, it's me. I want to get my heart right with the Lord today. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Would you stretch up your hands so I can see it? It's his hands here, his hands here. I see your hand, sir. Yep, I see your hand. Your hands are going up everywhere. Yes, I see your hand in the back. Young man, I see your hand right here. Yes. Yes. The greatest decision that you will ever make, I see your hand, ma'am. The greatest decision that you will ever make is giving your heart to Jesus. To live in open heaven. To say, Lord, all of me for all of you. You're here and you raised your hand with your heads bowed, your eyes closed. I just want you to pray this prayer after me. It's not the prayer that that necessarily saves you. It's the belief in confession of saying, Lord, I need you. So I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. And, and again, I just want you to believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. Would you repeat in church? Would you join? Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. The price he paid on that cross not just for the world's sin, but for mine, all of it. I thank you for the great exchange of what has been is going to meet what will be. I declare over my life the spirit of an overcomer, the spirit of a breaker. Old things are gone and new things are here. Lord, take all of me. Not just the bad stuff, the good stuff, all of it's yours. I confess my need for you, not just to become my Savior, but to become my Lord. Lord, everything that I am, for everything that you have for me. We pray this in the name of Jesus, and everybody says, Parkway, would you join with heaven and give the Lord a big round of applause? Hallelujah. 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 You raised your hand. Some of you are recommitting your life to the Lord. Some of you are, are saying yes to Jesus for the first time. Pastor Jim, would you come stand right down here so everyone can see you? 
Pastor Jim leads our Yes Team ministry. If you're serious and you're wanting to get connected and know about that decision that you just made a little bit, a little bit ago, uh, that's a wonderful man to talk to. He actually took me out to lunch this week and lined me out, so that was good. He's got a loving way about him, an encouraging way about him. And I want you to know that we have a team of, of people that are ready to, to walk this road with you. All right. I, I've left some time with this service, and I, I want you to know as your pastor, if you feel like you need to be dismissed after I do this, uh, please, please, no condemnation. I recognize that we've all got plans. But I believe that there's power and declaration in this room. Declaring that where I've been is not where I'm going. And I want the two to meet. And it meets, it gets met at an altar moment. And so my wife is going to lead us in a couple worship songs, but this is what I, what I feel as your pastor. There are people here that are on, on all sides of the spectrum of you're dealing with addiction to drugs or pornography or sexual things, or you're, you're dealing with hard things, trauma. The, the, you feel like they're major things, and I want you to know that the Lord wants you to declare a new season over your life. And it also can be all the way that you're not just declaring for certain things over your life, but you're also declaring for your sons and your daughters to come home. You're, you're declaring for things in your marriage to, to be restored and reconciled. But there's something about power and declaration. And I, I want to pray for you. I, I want our, our prayer team to pray for you. If you're sick in your body and you need God to, to, to deliver you from your infirmity or your ailment, declaring healing and wholeness over your body is what we're going to do right now. And I don't know who you are. I don't know if you're going to be brave enough to be able to do it. I know I am. I'm going to find a place down here at an altar for a few minutes before I pray for you. And I'm going to begin to declare, I'm going to begin to declare great things over my life and over my family. I'm not, I, I'm tired of agreeing with the enemy. And this morning, I'm going to begin to start declaring and agreeing with what God has. And so I don't know where you're at. I don't know if this is going to land on you in a good way. But I want you to come now if you want to declare some things over your life. I want you to come. Get out of your seat. And I want you to come forward. And my wife is going to lead us in a song. And I'm going to pray for you.
Yeah. 